Um, I want to sh in the pre the presentation today, uh, today, I want to talk about multi-target approaches to in anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical industry has a problem because many drugs fail in a late phase of the pipeline in stage two or stage three. And this causes high cost and reduces efficacy uh, this causes high cost and reduces uh, productivity. And as can be seen on this chart, the main reason for this is a lack in efficacy followed by toxicity. Going back to the design stage, we have to ask ourselves what happened there? And could the compounds not have been designed with higher efficacy and safety in the first term? In contrast to the so-called golden age of drug design in the 60s and 70s, which was based completely on phenotypical screenings, we now follow a more rational approach. This approach suggests that uh, one disease is associated with one target. And this one disease, one target paradigm has been the predominant paradigm in drug discovery for the last 30 years or so. However, this is a very simplistic view on the complex processes in our body, which eventually led to the question, is it sufficient to interact with only one target? Or, on the other hand, can a complete inhibition of a target not lead to toxic effects? And in fact, most of the drugs already interact with more than one target, even though they were defined uh, designed to interact with only one target. And to give you an impression of this, we did a small study. We used the Campbell database as a data source and checked how many uh, targets are associated with a compound. And we found that over, almost 50% of the compounds have more than one target. And in fact, that's about two targets per compound. Now, the Campbell database is an experimental database, and many compounds have not been characterized that much. Therefore, we do the same statistics with the drug bank database. And here the picture gets even worse. For each drug, there are, in average, about four targets. And all these drugs have been designed to interact with only one target, but they are actually interacting with multiple targets. So what would happen if we would rationally design multi-target drugs? Let me take inflammation as an example. Inflammation is a part of the biological response of vascular tissues to harmful stimuli. So it's in a physiological state. It's involved in multiple diseases like asthma, uh, metabolic syndrome, or cancer. And while a lot of different mediator, mediator, mediators, sorry, like interleukins or NF-kappa B play a role in inflammation, the main player is the arachidonic acid cascade. In this cascade, Aristotelic acid gets converted to a multitude of modulators. For example, in the Cox branch, it is converted to prostaglandins. In the 5LO branch, it is converted to 5-PT and subsequently to leukotrienes. And in the cytochrome P450 branch, it is converted to epoxy eicosatrionic acids, which are subsequently hydrolyzed to the corresponding diols. It has been shown that an inhibition of SEH alone promotes abominorrhea in mice with progressive renal disease. And this is because of a shunting effect in the cascade, which leads to a shift uh, towards the 5LO branch, causing higher 5LO product formation and sub subsequently albuminuria. However, it has also been shown that an inhibition of SEH enhances the anti-inflammatory effects of COX and LOX inhibitors in vivo. It has furthermore been shown that a dual SEH-COX-2 inhibitor, such as the one shown here, uh, was more effective than the same dose of either a COX-2 inhibitor or a SEH inhibitor alone, as well as co-administration of both inhibitors in vivo. So our working hypothesis was that a dual 5LO SEH, SEH inhibitor will not only have higher efficacy, but also be safer for the treatment of inflammatory conditions. So what would a typical MedCam approach do dual ligands B. Typically, one would use two selective ligands of both targets, and then there are a number of options to combine the relevant frameworks. They could be linked using an optionally cleavable linker, they could be fused, or they could be merged. 
In our first study, we followed the linking approach. And therefore, we used these two uh, inhibitors of 5 alone SEH as a starting point and combined the highlighted frame uh, scaffolds using a very simple linker. And while the IC50 values are very good for the 5 alone, in case of the SEH, they are more than tenfold worse. So we synthesized a couple of deriv derivatives and did a small SAR. Starting with this framework, we substituted R1 and R2 with a uh, uh, couple of groups like cyclohexyl, isopropyl, a uh, couple of aromatin, arom aromatics, and um, adamantyl. And the best inhibitor was this one, which now has equimolar IC50 values in a low nanomolar range on both targets. However, it was completely inactive in human whole blood at 100 micromolar. <coughs> And this is an example for a common problem when following, following the linking approach. Linking often leads to large and complex molecules with low ligand efficacy, poor PK properties, complex SAR, and they are hard to optimize. And therefore, in the next study, we followed a slightly different approach. We wanted to find compounds which have the relevant interaction patterns in the same scaffold. So we wanted to find compounds which are fused or merged. Um, and the idea was that compounds may bind to different targets in different conformations, and therefore satisfy different pharmacophore models sharing the same features. Again, we started with uh, known active compounds of 5LO and SEH. We then generated conformations of these ligands and used these conformations to automatically elucidate pharmacophore models. Um, for each target, we created a multitude of models, and these models were then aligned to yield dual models. With these dual models, we searched the SNX database and uh, scored the resulting hits using a shape wave method. Using this workflow, we were able to identify nine fragment-sized um, compounds which were either active on 5LO or SEH. Underneath them, one compound, number 28, which uh, was active in both targets with IC50 values in the low micromolar range. Additionally, the scaffold represents a whole new class of SEH inhibitors, since uh, benz imidazoles have not been reported before as SEH inhibitors. In comparison to the compound uh, created by the linking approach, this has, has a much higher IC50 value. However, the ligand efficiency is much, be much better because it is smaller, there's uh, much more space for optimization, and in the next study, I want to show you how one could start with fragment-sized inhibitors to find bigger ones which have uh, better efficiency. Uh, a usual HDS setting would be to screen a library of about 500,000 compounds, and then you get approximately 200 hits for both ta for target A and target B. So what you do is to search this chemical space created by the library and what you want to find is the small overlap between both targets. Now, if there's a hit rate of only 0.05%, then the probability to find a dual ligand in this space is very small. However, Op uh, Hopkins et al. have shown that the number of targets is linearly correlated to the mean molecular weight. So co uh, smaller compounds have more targets. Therefore, we again followed the fragment-based approach and um, used self-organizing maps. On the upper left is again shown the, the drug-like chemical space created by, example, for example, the drug bank, and in the space are subspaces for SEH and 5 lo And what we want to find is the shared chemical space, which is the overlap of both um, subspaces. We used a self-organizing map, or actually two self-organizing maps, to, and they were trained on known actives of SEH and 5LO with the drug bank as background distribution. We then aligned the self-organizing maps um, to introduce a three-dimensional map, where the third dimension is the similarity of the underlying, underlying neurons of the original maps. And the similarity is represented in the altitude of the neurons. And what we wanted to see were those neurons which have a high altitude and are colored dark green, because those are the neurons which have an equal amount of SEH and 5-LO inhibitors associated with them, 
and have a high similarity. And after, ins after inspecting these neurons, we found these 11 compounds. Again, there were benthimeter salts that were shown before already, but also new chemotypes which have not been reported for SEH or 5LO before. The most interesting compound, for, however, for us was this one, because we knew that we had uh, a couple of compounds in our in-house library which had this uh, scaffold. So we did a substructure search for this scaffold and came up with uh, this compound, which now has IC50 values for both targets in the low to mid nanomolar range and also inhibits 80% of local dry end production in human whole blood. So let me sum up. Uh, in part one, I showed you a linking approach which yielded novel dual SEH 5 alone inhibitors. They have nanomolar IC50 in recombinant enzyme. However, they are inactive in human whole blood. In part two, I showed you a new method for in silico search for dual ligands, which yielded several inhibitors for either SEH or 5 lo Underneath them, the first reported dual SEH 5 lo inhibitor, inhibitor, and uh, we were able to show benzimidazole salts as a new class of SEH inhibitors. Part three was about another uh, in silico approach for dual ligands, where we were able to find a dual inhibitor with nanomolar IC50 in recombinant enzyme, which was also active in whole blood. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and questions, please. Thank you for your nice talk. We have uh, time for a couple of questions. Uh, I can start one. So you talk a lot about the ligands, yes. and you have uh, two targets. Can you mention have, um, a little more about those targets? Those Sorry. are all enzymes or like cellular proteins or the targets for those drugs? Ah, yeah, they're both uh, located in the arachidonic acid cascade, as I showed before. Uh, wait. So, right here. Uh, they're both targets are the 5LO and the SEH. And as I said before, um, when inhibiting SEH alone, this cascade shifts toward the 5 lo branch, which causes albuminuria. Therefore, we block both targets, SEH and 5 lo because it has also been shown that a co-inhibition of, uh, for example, SEH and COX or SEH and 5 lo has higher anti-inflammatory effects than a single inhibition of one of those targets. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> what is the advantage using a dual ligand uh, compared to two ligands which touch all uh, bo both enzymes separately? Um, using two separate compounds has the, the difficulty for, for balancing, find, to find the right balance, and you have to uh, do pharmacokinetic studies for both, target, uh, for both compounds. You have to do all this research for both compounds. And with the dual ligand, you have to do it only once. And if you consider a typical drug uh, discovery uh, campaign, which costs $1 billion, then you would have to do it twice for two compounds instead of only once. Very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, quick question. Oh, well, falls into two two parts perhaps. One is um, about, with this light up, it reminded me of the fact that you're actually dealing with a substrate which is very common to both potential proteins. Yes. So you have a, a very similar binding site. <coughs> that therefore leads to question A, which is, is this approach particularly pertinent to situations where one substrate goes and splits into two particular biological pathways? Um, or alternatively, is this approach particularly important in the context of, of targets which are inherently uh, difficult to hit selectively anyway, like kinases, and they are fall onto a particular signaling cascade so that actually you're augmenting one pharmacology with a separate pharmacology which you built in? Um, well, I think it's easier to find dual ligands if the, the substrates are similar. Of, of course, it's, sure, it's, it's, it's clear. Um, however, we don't know, for example, where the compounds bind at the 5LO, because there are multiple binding sites, and we can't say with certainty which site we address with these dual compounds. In case of the SEH, it is clear, but in case of the 5LO, we don't know it. Um, furthermore, a um, colleague of mine did dual uh, SEH PIPA gamma uh, inhibitors, which have clearly different substrates. 
and they work too. So I don't think it is, it makes it easier if they share the same um, substrate, but um, it is also possible if this is, not, this is not the case. And what was the second question? So uh, based on the mechanism, if you block 5-LO and SEH, that should lead to an accumulation of epoxide. Yes. And that uh, probably will be a problem. The epoxides, the EETs, have been shown to have uh, anti-inflammatory effects, while the diols have pro-inflammatory effects. Therefore, you want to have these EETs and not the DHETs. Also, epoxides are quite reactive. Yes, they are. But um, they have not been shown any, any um, bad effects when, when uh, blocking SEH and having these uh, EETs, except for the shunt in the, five, in the cascade. Mm 